Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us here today. Thank you, uh, and welcome to our audience who are uh, viewing this uh, issue briefing on our webcast platform at www.weforum.org. Very excited to be here. This is our first issue briefing in the history of the annual meeting yeah. in Davos. They're, uh, they're slightly slightly uh, different to the, the normal fare you have here. They're not press conferences, they're not announcements as such. It's simply a, 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 a tool for taking some of the, uh, yeah, the high class intelligence that we are able to convene upstairs in the Congress Center and bring the, the some of the cleverest down here to answer questions on you know, topics which we know are um, yeah, of, of particular person and particular interest. As I mentioned, this is the, the, you know, the very first one. It's on the subject which is uh, you know, a perennial favorite on our own forum blog platform, artificial, artificial intelligence. I'm going to keep this very uh, free and, and, and hopefully informal. I'm going to ask our two speakers, who, are, who I will introduce in a, a second, to give a, a, a make a, a, some, uh, some brief remarks on the session they've, uh, they've been participating in this morning, and also um, give us the benefit of their experience in the field of artificial intelligence. And then we'll, uh, we'll leave it open for Q&A. So without further ado, um, I'm very, very pleased to be joined by Alison Goldnick, Gold, Gopnik, I do apologize, Professor of Psychology at the University of California in Berkeley. And uh, Ken, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Ken is a professor also from Berkeley, and uh, his specialist area is, is robotics. Uh, Alison, perhaps we could uh, start by giving us a, a bit of a briefing on uh, your particular entry point into this subject, and perhaps share some thoughts from the, the session this morning. So I actually study how children can learn as much as they do. And about 10 or 15 years ago, we started collaborating with computer scientists who were trying to design machines that could learn uh, uh, in the way that children do, partly to figure out about machines, but also to use that as a model for children. And I think one of the things that uh, points that Ken made in his talk is that the interest of AI has been to discover that many things that we thought were going to be very hard have turned out to be pretty easy, and things that we thought were going to be very easy have turned out to be very hard. So. For example, it turns out to be much easier to simulate a grandmaster chess player than it is to simulate a two-year-old. Um, uh, and what we've realized is just, this has made us realize just how much even, say, what a two-year-old learns uh, involves processes that we don't really understand very well and that are very powerful indeed. And I think that was one of the themes that came up in the, in the meeting is that uh, things like chess or theorem proving... Uh, the the uh, the great ways that you know nerds prove their machismo have turned out to be not so not actually so hard, whereas things like picking up a cup or recognizing a face have turned out to be or getting uh, to an appointment on time. Or, get, or have turned out. To, yeah, <laughs> robots would be robots are much better at doing that because they aren't distracted. Um, so I think that was one message, and then another message that uh, that Ken emphasized and others emphasized is the question about values. So. We know that if we have a goal, we can design a machine with a lot of when we with by using a lot of smarts ourselves that can get to that machine, but it can get to that goal. But then, when the decision becomes which goals are actually worth getting to, that's something that's a much harder thing to get a machine to do. Should I um, please do follow up on that? Thank you, Allison. So the the we actually had we came to a fair amount of actual agreement that the, in particular, you've heard so much of the, the press coverage recently about Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk talking about the singularity. And uh, so one idea I want to I wanna propose is that it's time to, to actually move beyond the singularity. And instead, I propose the multiplicity. Excuse me, the multiplicity is the idea of mul many people, groups of people working together with groups of machines to solve problems. So this is a, I think this is actually a much more constructive idea because it actually is something we're already doing. In a sense, if you think about Google's search engine, is a multiplicity. The way it works is that every right. human, it's using all the human linking structures, human provided linking structures. It actually is testing humans all the time when you gives you a list of, um, of responses for a search term. It sees what you click on and it uses it to update so it's smarter the next time. So it's using humans and machines. And that symbiotic combination is something we don't understand enough about yet. So one of the areas of interest at Berkeley and other labs is how do we start really developing a science for this kind of both collective intelligence of humans, but, but also collective intelligence where humans and machines are interacting with each other. So that we, we think that that, and I don't think the term multiplicity has um, been um, 
put out there yet, and we're hoping if you as a press can uh, circulate it. This is, a, this is our first uh, announcement of that word. Um, we'll see if it catches on. But um, I think that that idea is, it, it's time to start talking about that instead of singularity. And the other idea we, we, we talked about this morning was um, <clears throat> that there's been a big ad advance in the field of robotics, which is we've always assumed that robots have to carry all their um, computing on board. It's just an assumption we never questioned. But it's actually, we're now realizing that it's not the case, that robots will almost always be in a place where they can get access to the cloud. And now we can do processing in the cloud so that very complex statistical computations can be done in the cloud. But then the side benefit is that all that data is available in the cloud so that it can be shared across robots so that the collective can grow and exchange ideas and, um, and information and models between each other. So collectively, they get much better over time. So this idea of cloud robotics is another new development. So actually, this is a press conference. We have an announcement. Multiplicity is a, is a, is a, is a new <laughs> word breaking, yeah. in, the, in the parlance of artificial intelligence. Um, both, can you perhaps show your personal highlights or, or key learnings from this morning's session? Uh, there, could, were there, there, there were four people on the panel, I, I understand as well, and, and yeah. computer scientists, not just yourself. So, um, you know, it's a collaborative effort, um, you know, advancing artificial intelligence. Anything, anything that our, you know, our colleagues here should be, should be um, considering writing about? Well, well, there's one thing we, I think we, we completely agree on, and which is that there's, there's certain categories, uh, I would say, that have to do with, with aesthetics and art, um, emotion, um, that, uh, and design, um, and one is um, humor. I don't think we'll ever see a robot telling a great joke in our lifetime. And there, so there's a lot of limitations or, or you know, essentially areas where I, I conceded to the opposition on that, those points. I think that we're, they're not going to make better jokes than humans. Maybe I'm, I'll be wrong. But, uh, and, and then the other thing that surprised me, at least, was fascinating study of human nature. Everyone voted on which side they agreed on at the beginning and then at the end. And almost no one changed their mind, <laughs> <laughs> and despite an hour of us <laughs> trying to offer new ideas. Nobody changed their mind. So this confirmation bias is incredibly alive and well. Well, I think that's true. But I think also part of the reason for that was, it, in a way, you know, there was, m for a debate, there was more agreement than in some ways there was yeah. disagreement. Because I think there's, there's pretty general agreement that computers have gotten to be very good at certain kinds of things. So being able to learn from big data sets, for example. Those techniques for statistically pulling out statistical patterns from big, big sets of data, that's been a real advance. And everyone could agree that that's been a real advance. Mm -hmm. Using things like Bayesian probability theory to make inferences, that's been a real advance. And everyone could agree that that was a real advance. The places where... If it's going to be solved, as, as Stuart Russell said, it'll be three or four breakthroughs at least down the line are things like creativity, being able to actually think of a new idea, being able to change the idea you already have, mm -hmm. um, integrating the kinds of things that we humans do with emotion into what AI does. That's something that we don't understand very well. Um, and, uh, and figuring out how exactly we manage our values, what it means to have a moral system, what it means to have a value system, how it is that we can decide, as people at Davos do, for example, that we need a new value system, that the value system that most people hold isn't working and we need to persuade people to shift their values. That's a very, those are all things that are way out on the horizon, very, very far removed from what although, the current systems are. Although I just came from another session where we were talking about um, manners and digital this sort of obnoxious behavior of holding your phone on when you're, when you're meet, talking with someone. And we were saying that, well, we really can change. I mean, manners and behavior can change. And an example of this is uh, smoking. Right? It was just a, not too long ago when it was very common to just have cigarettes at the table, et cetera. And now, at least in the U.S. and I think many other countries in Europe, you can really can't do that anymore. And we've adapted in a relatively short time. So maybe we need a call for a kind of manners, change of behavior in terms of other, other in terms of technologies. Mm -hmm. There should be a, like a, um, a school of, of etiquette that we should maybe learn and, and then start to adopt so before it's too late. I think, another, I think another issue that came up in the meeting that I think is worth pointing out is that in some ways they were sort of there are sort of two separate questions one of them is will we have the super intelligent computers anytime soon and 
at least things like being able to revise and change what we think, being able to be creative, to being able to have moral values, I don't think any of those are on the horizon. But no. I think another thing that came out is there can be lots of damage without having the super intelligent computers. So, you know, natural stupidity will beat out artificial intelligence any time for really screwing things up. Um, we have plenty of uh, natural stupidity. And the combination of natural stupidity and artificial intelligence can be a really dangerous combination. So we do have to think about how we regulate uh, things like uh, uh, autonomous weapons, uh, an example that Stuart gave, or things like a machine that can suddenly change the way the stock market works. And we need to think much more about how to do that. Now, that all is true even with machines that aren't anywhere nearly as intelligent as we are. It is still true that those machines, especially in the hands of occasionally incredibly intelligent but also amazingly stupid humans, uh, especially grown-up humans. It might be better if they were just in the hands of two-year-olds. Um, uh, we should have two-year-olds at, at, at the that. World Economic Forum. Yeah. That would be a great session. <laughs> Noted. Well, let's, let's, let's work with that. Before I hand over to questions, um, what was the voting? Give us, a, give us an idea of what the voting was before oh, the, end of the was, session. Okay, so at the beginning... We won, by yeah. the way. Let me just point this out. They won, won by a slim margin. But Eric, <laughs> it was about 50-50 about who thought it was that machines yeah, would make better decisions than humans, and at the end it was the same. I mean, it was, it, there was a few few points that it, they had changed, they had, they had beaten us, but... Um, it was interesting that it was 50-50. I wouldn't have predicted that. I wouldn't that have either, me. yeah. Very interesting. Okay, let's have some questions. <coughs> okay, we'll uh, we have a microphone down here. For the benefit of our, our, our audience uh, online, could you also give your name, please, and your outlet? The gentleman sure. will take yours and Michael there in the front row. Hi, it's Jim Edwards from Business Insider, and I would just want to ask the really dumb question about Elon Musk, who keeps telling people that robots will come to kill us all as soon as they become smart enough. Smart enough. So is he right? Will the robots kill us all as soon as they become smart enough? No. <laughs> no, absolutely not. Elaborate. I, first of all, I, thank you for being from Business Insider, which uh, ranked UC Berkeley as the number one school f to study robotics. <laughs> so thank you. Um, but it's very uh, cozy, isn't it? <laughs> 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 but I will say that, no, this is actually, this kind of fear is, is exactly what the wrong thing. What we need to be doing now is, uh, is being constructive, not talking about the singularity, because I don't think that's even close. I think what we, the much better, m more interesting thing is this multiplicity idea. Michael Jarlen from uh, Politik in Denmark. Could you, could you please uh, broaden out the perspectives in this uh, cloud robots you were talking about? Well, so there's really five, uh, very quickly, there's five advantages to having robots connected to the cloud. The first one is, is, is access to data because you can, suddenly you can carry maps, you get access to maps and all kinds of models of objects around you. Uh, it's enormous. Second is computation. So when you want to be able to plan uh, a series of motions, that is actually right now with uncertainty as the central problem for robotics, it takes, requires vast amounts of computing. And you can't carry that much computing on board. So you can do that in the cloud. And the third one is the idea that the cloud is actually providing the ability for robots to communicate with each other and share information. So every time a robot is acting in the world, they're doing essentially an experiment. So they report back the outcome of that experiment, and that gets shared and integrated together. The fourth one is the idea that it, the cloud is facilitating the exchange of humans uh, sharing software and this is accelerating research in robotics. So there's an open source platform called ROS and something else called Robot, Robot, um, Robotics as a Service that is a new idea, which is basically where you'll be able to very quickly, it's a software architecture that lets you very quickly get access to um, robot algorithms. And the very last one is that no matter what system you have to program your robot, there'll always be cases where it, it, things fail or it gets stuck. And then, because you're access to the cloud, you should, the robot should identify those situations and then um, can tap into um, a human uh, call center. <laughs> so it sort of reverses what we have now where yeah. we call and we get a robot on the phone. The robot will call and get a human on the phone who will help diagnose the problem and, and resolve it. So and those the, five the robot will say, oh, no, not one of those humans again. <laughs> Yeah, so th I think those things are all, that's opening up all those five channels are, are brand new and they're really accelerating the field. Fascinating. Um, gentleman at the back there, please. And then after that, the gentleman there near the middle. Hi, Bert Schmidt from uh, Schweiz am Sonntag. I just uh, would like to add to that question before. 
do you have an idea, a vision, what kind of jobs going to be replaced by robotics or ar artificial intelligence for the next five to ten or even beyond? Yes. So I do have one answer to that, and I'm, I'm going to yield it to Allison in a minute, because in the Swiss um, uh, expertise, they have scheduled me to be at a, um, a panel in seven minutes. So I have Yay. to dash over to there, and I apologize. Um, but I will say this, that um, I do have an idea about that. I think that that, that there's a huge opportunities right now for teaching. That there are l there's a vast need for teachers, not just in classrooms, but for teaching all kinds of things. And that is undertapped right now. And so could we find a way economically to allow people to be rewarded for teaching? We feel, and I think most of us have experienced, teaching is incredibly rewarding. So someone out of work, if they have even part-time part jobs teaching in some fashion, I think there's enormous potential for that. And so if we, we can transform the people who are put out of work, which will be inevitable in the short term, but start to provide, use technology to allow them to teach in new ways, I think that could be a really constructive outcome. So is it okay if I, um, if I depart? Please do. All right, I apologize. Thank you I'll very much. I'll leave you in excellent time. hands, because yeah. Allison's terrific. All okay, right, so thank you. Okay, so get your hard all. questions ready now. We just have a <laughs> Allison here. Do you have any comments, Alison, on that on that one point, the jobs and and, and the I guess the ec the the most obvious economic impact? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think there's it's fairly clear that jobs that were just as jobs that were once mechanically done by people in factories are now being done by robots. Um, some jobs that were done using our minds and brains are going to be increasingly done by. Uh, by artificial intelligence. But I think part of what comes out of the session is that there's enough scope for the things that people are much, much better at than, uh, than computers that th the optimistic thought is, and those are, those are the things that are the most human ones anyway, being able to do things like have creative new ideas or consider changes in values. Uh, if more of us were engaged in doing that, if we could find a business model for creative thought about progress in the future, then uh, that might not be a, a bad thing, that might not be a bad thing to happen at all. Okay, if I may, we'll take one more question before we, we close this. Gentleman here in the, by the middle. Uh, I'm uh, Tetsuya Garashi from NHK Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, nice to meet you. Um, uh, I have like three questions, but I'll just take one. <laughs> all right. mm -hmm. And um, uh, I've been researching about the advancements in technology and well, in the past five years, it, there's big advancements. On um, what do you think the societal uh, drivers of those advancements? Yeah. Well, the, there's a very interesting point which uh, Ken mentioned talking about his his multiplicity idea, which is that a lot of the big advances have come because um, the computers have really been using these millions and millions of examples of these incredibly high-powered computers that have been chained together in a way that they never were before to solve problems, namely all the human beings who are using the Internet. So we have these fantastic, uh, we have these fantastically powerful computers and they're all working together to put cute cats out on the Internet. And then um, Google can actually use the output of all of those people finding the best cat picture to get an algorithm that actually lets you recognize cat pictures, which is something that every one-year-old can, uh, can do with much less data. So some of the advances have come because there's been big improvements in our ability to do things like pick out statistical patterns. But a lot of the advances has, have come because there's now data available, not only big data in large quantities because of the internet, but also data that's been pre-digested by human beings. So to take another example, machine translation depends on the fact that we have access to millions of human beings who are translating data all the time. And a lot of the advances, uh, you know, the, the terrible dystopian um, a uh, picture of the, in the matrix of, you know, we're all lying there thinking that we're having fun, but really we're just feeding the machines. That's actually just true. So as, as we're sitting there putting up Instagrams of our cute cats, what we're also doing is giving data and information to machines in a way that they didn't have it before. So it's, it's an interesting question. Is a computer aided by a million human beings who are, who are doing the work without knowing it um, a super intelligent computer or or not. They're not, it's not super intelligent in the way that a baby is super intelligent, but it m can do things that we really couldn't do before. So I think there's quite a lot of reason to believe that having the internet, having 
having computers be able to have access to all of those brains and the output of all of those human brains and use that in their computing has been the thing, or at least one thing, that's made the big difference. Uh, Alison, a final word, if I may. What will be the focus of your work in 2015? In 2015? Well, what we're interested in... So let me back up for a minute and say... You know, what Alan Turing proved all those years ago was that if we can take any process and describe it in a systematic step-by-step -step way, then we can program that onto a computer. So when we say computers can't do things, it, what it means is we don't really understand how they're, done, uh, how they're done yet. So the thing that we're trying to understand is how is it possible for people to be creative? That's something we just kind of take for granted. But if you think about creativity from a computational perspective, what it really means is there's this infinite, enormous scope of possibilities, possible ideas that we could have, possible skills we could have, possible ways we could organize ourselves into a society. And somehow you have to decide which one of those is going to have the best outcome without knowing it in advance. And somehow human beings, in fact, not just even, but especially three and four-year-olds, can get a sense of, here's a crazy, weird idea, but it's sort of in the ballpark of something that would work. And we don't really know how that's possible for adults, uh, creative adults who are innovative like scientists, or for two and three-year-olds who are pretending, or for computers. So what I'm working on right now is to try and see, can we give some kind of uh, story about how things like play and imagination could actually be implemented in a computational way. Well, thank you very much indeed. We've, we're, we're running out of time, and uh, like all Swiss organizations, we must.